Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you all, and welcome to another Star Citizen video. If you're listening to this on Spotify, welcome to episode four of season two of the Divine Interventions podcast. Today, I want to talk about something on my mind recently as I've been playing more and more Star Citizen and enjoying it more and more, and that is why I ditched Elite Dangerous. Before we begin, I stream every Friday and Saturday evening over on Twitch at twitch.tv slash the ninth divine. I'm starting to stream Star Citizen a bit more, so if you're curious, please feel free to stop on by and say hello there. Let's make one thing blatantly obvious. Elite Dangerous never had, and I don't believe ever will, have the funding that Star Citizen has currently. That's over 560 million US dollars with 4.4 million backers. In a stark comparison, Elite Dangerous has sold 4.3 million franchise units, 3 million of the base game and 1.3 million Horizons expansion units, whereas Star Citizen has only sold 1.7 as of October of last year. Of course, there are massive differences in game style, size and arguably quality, but I wanted to talk about exactly why I stopped playing Elite Dangerous in the first place. I had around 800 hours played in the game, which I know isn't anything compared to the diehard fans of it, but for the most part, I loved it. I grinded both Navy and Imperial faction ranks in order to buy some of the biggest ships in the game. I engineered some ships to the absolute max and spent a ton of time out in the black doing mining runs so I could pay for those ships and those ship parts. Each ship could have bigger and better thrusters, shields, power plants, missiles, guns, and different qualities for each, whether that be cooling, better armor or sustainability, even being lighter. If your ship was lighter, it would be faster and therefore more fuel efficient. The game itself has 400 billion star systems that are modeled on actual galactic charts, including our own solar system and a one-to-one -one scale simulation of the Milky Way galaxy. If you happen to come upon a planet that was previously undiscovered by you or by any other player, you'd have your commander's name labeled on that planet as the discoverer forever. For either bragging rights or roleplay opportunities if you want to do that's a pretty fucking cool feature. Players and members of the community have their own groups for assistance out in space, whether it be for combat or even refueling your ship if you end up stranded. For both Elite Dangerous and Star Citizen, you could purchase a program called Voice Attack and in turn use an HCS voice pack to issue verbal commands for in-game use that would do a variety of different functions. I used the voice pack for Elite when I played, and that was the voice that spoke back to me as my ship's AI, and that was the one and only William Shatner, and that's pretty fucking sick. If you wanted to, you could spend days or even months outside of the bubble exploring other worlds, mining, or even fighting aliens. If you really, really wanted to, you could travel to the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way called Sagittarius A. You could kill pirates, become a bounty hunter, take assassination missions, and dogfight with other players. I'll hand it to Elite that the sound in game was always pretty next level. Deep core mining in asteroid fields produced a sound much like that of a seismic charge from Star Wars. Ship engines, thrusters, guns, and missiles all sounded pretty great. The visuals were regularly stunning, and I managed to get several incredible screenshots over the 800 hours that I played the game. Even though Elite Dangerous had its pros, it had its fair share of failures. In a space sim that takes place roughly around the year 3300, space still felt empty and lackluster. The community had wanted more immersion in this beautiful game, but cries for it were ignored and pushed aside and just fell on deaf ears. Ship engineering required an insane amount of material farming and traveling across the systems, sometimes tens of thousands of light years away from the populated area called the bubble, just to be able to get better parts for your ship. 
Frontier Development's latest DLC that was introduced to Elite, called Odyssey, was originally very promising. The community was finally granted the ability to walk around and explore planet surfaces, their ship hangars to walk around their ships and view them to scale, and even walk around station interiors. With the help of brand new terrain generation tech, some planets and atmospheres and atmospheric scattering with additional detail of the terrain, but the detail only really existed from high above the surface. As you got closer, that terrain that you thought was there ended up being really smooth and unnatural with a lot of repeating textures. There was an additional rock scattering side of the new tech that was also completely absent from the launch, and on top of general lack of surface variety, you were missing canyons, mountains, and just other general terrain geometry. Odyssey's launch back in May of 2021 was rushed out by the developers and was riddled with horrible performance issues and bugs, so much so that the Frontier Development CEO personally apologized to the community. Management had seemingly shoved a half-finished product into the hands of consumers, coincidentally to line up with their fiscal year, as the Odyssey DLC was dropped right before Frontier Developments had to report their annual earnings. Needless to say, this is a shady as fuck business tactic to make a company look more valuable than it actually is. In March of 2022, Frontier ceased development of the console version of the Odyssey expansion completely. To quickly mention how many copies of Elite Dangerous were sold at a whopping 4.3 million, the all-time peak of active players was just two years ago at just shy of 30,000. Between myself and two others, who we'll just call S and B for the sake of anonymity, we felt like we were participating in a $40 beta. Server outages were frequent, and bugs were awful and everywhere. The previous version or update to the game called Horizons allowed you to explore planet surfaces. If you didn't have the Horizons expansion, you had no access to the ship components that would allow you to land on the planets or the moons. Any players on the Odyssey DLC couldn't form wings or crews with anyone on the Horizons expansion, and vice versa. At one point, Elite Dangerous introduced these massive aircraft carrier types of ships, called fleet carriers, and they did exactly what you think they would. They could carry fleets of ships. You could go on long-range mining or exploration missions with multiple ships docked to this one megaship. It sounded awesome for groups and squads, but the price of a fleet carrier on average was around 5 billion in-game credits. Depending on what features your carrier had, like commodity buying or selling, an armory, a shipyard, or outfitting, it could cost up to 14 million credits for upkeep weekly. Something that really bugged me nearly always was the fact that NPC ships were still getting stuck in the entrance mail slots to stations, even after Odyssey's release. To quickly break this down, some ships had the option for an advanced docking computer component that allowed your ship to take off from stations and land in stations completely autonomously. It was nearly perfect. The exception to its perfection was the fact that NPC ships would just cause a space traffic jam. Sometimes the only way was to brute force your way through them and the mail slot while risking getting shot at or even destroyed by the station's weapons. This bug or this issue in the game existed for years and even during Elite's biggest update it had ever received, it still wasn't fixed. Elite Dangerous wasn't a space game for me, rather than a space ship game. Players who don't have the Odyssey expansion are limited to being in their ship or their SRV land vehicle 24-7-365 while out in the black. There's no getting up, no walking around, no bathrooms, no sleeping, no shitting. Odyssey introduced space legs, yes but getting out of your ship was a fade to black scene and a sound effect. There was no ramp, no visual elevator into a door, and then maybe a fade to black scene there. It was one keybind and boom, you were in your cockpit. 
on nearly every ship. The elevator area to enter it was just a random place near the cockpit with no visual elevator on the bottom of the ship itself. When the community first heard about space legs coming to Elite, the first thought was, finally, we'll be able to walk around the cockpit. We'll finally be able to see what the inside of these magnificent spaceships look like, even if that hope was somewhere further down the roadmap. This very feature of the game was promised by the CEO himself 10 years ago during its Kickstarter campaign. He stated that ships were designed with the interiors in mind regarding how cargo is loaded and unloaded, how damage occurs, and said that down the line we would be able to walk around inside of our ship, get out of the ship, walk around inside space stations, other vehicles, and all of that sort of thing. A lead designer at FDEV stated that he'd love to see players running around their ships, dealing with emergencies, repelling borders, cleaning up toxic spills, and more. Multiple other artists, designers, and members of the development team previously said how they were going to go about doing all of this by measuring the size of each ship, where elevators were positioned, etc. But unfortunately, ship interiors will never be implemented into Elite Dangerous. The team over at Frontier Developments had gone back on their CEO's word and now have said that they absolutely have no plans for ship interiors because it's the belief of the development team that the ship interiors don't add enough value to gameplay loops. It's the belief of the developers that in a scenario of my ship is damaged and I need to get the fuck out of here and the I need to run across my ship to get to my cockpit to leave has no additional value. Frontier believes that running through your ship to get to the cockpit or into the station would become tiresome after 10 to 15 times. I'll just outright say it, that is 100% pure grade bullshit. I want that genuine red alert moment in a video game. The developers believe that there's no benefit and they clearly don't have one shred of an iota of a clue about how much gameplay could improve. As for Star Citizen, I bought a game package nearly eight years ago, around the same time I was playing Elite on a fairly regular basis. A coworker had mentioned that he was financially backing this up and coming space game called Star Citizen, and I had no idea what it was, but I was still pretty interested. I was able to get both the game itself as well as a ship that I could have for life for around 45 bucks. If I wanted, I'd never need to use another ship ever again, but my ship at the time was a Mustang Beta and I simply didn't have the PC hardware to be able to run the game and play it very much. Fast forward 8 years to 2023, I'm playing it on the regular. I upgraded my Mustang Beta to an Avenger Titan and then the Avenger Titan to a Drake Cutlass Black. I also purchased a Drake Dragonfly as well as a standalone Drake Corsair. I wholeheartedly know that these are virtual items in a game and just pixels, but they also contribute to the funding of the project. More funding towards that project means that the development team has a larger budget to introduce bigger and better things into the game, both before and after its full release. The ships I've purchased from the Star Citizen website are always something I'll have and be able to use, and therefore I can always make money off of them in-game on a regular basis. I know that the game I'm playing is still in alpha, and that I and other backers are in fact alpha testers. I'm still fully aware that the fact that Star Citizen in and of itself isn't set for a full release until 2027, another four years away, and the planned roadmap is massive. The game's progress tracker has teams, deliverables, and even durations for each one. The funding goals page is currently capped at $65 million USD. It was reached all the way back in 2014. Each funding goal included something new that would come to the game, such as ships or missions, backer earned in-game rewards, and even alien languages. Yeah, 
The team at Cloud Imperium Games is working with real world linguists to create distinctive and realistic alien languages for the three different alien races in the game. That shit's nuts. And while I rant and rave about why I prefer one game that's still in alpha compared to a fully released game, I'll clarify to say that this isn't to suck CIG's theoretical dick. This is to acknowledge the game they have created and to appreciate a developer for actually giving a shit about the player experience. Star Citizen is pretty seamless. Realistically, I think the only fade to black transition that exists in game is when you die and respawn. From waking up in a bed to walking into your ship's hangar, you can see the entire world around you. When I spawn at New Babbage, for example, I can take an elevator to a train. That train takes me from the middle of a city to the edge of the mountain range where that spaceport is. Once I'm off that train, I go up a few flights of stairs to the ASOP terminals where I can retrieve my ships and another elevator to get to the hangar. Taking off or landing in a spaceport gets you a spectacular view of giant metal hangar doors opening for you or closing behind you. And that doesn't even feel like just a cheap party trick. For me, it's all about immersion. If I quantum travel all the way across the system in my Corsair, I can get out of my cockpit, walk around my ship, or sit down and have a drink with my crew. If you have any sort of ship that doesn't only have a cockpit, you can get around out of your seat and stretch your space legs. If you land at a spaceport above a planet, Occasionally, you'll land on a pad and not inside a hangar. Once you disembark your ship, you'll be walking around the landing pad in the middle of space. It's the immersion of being in space with other ships and pilots around you that does it for me personally. I've always wanted to feel like I'm actually there, and Star Citizen accomplishes that very, very well. Some planets have high winds and storms, an atmospheric entry can get moisture and condensation on your ship's canopy. Not only does your ship heat up in the atmosphere when entering at high speeds, but the force of the entry will cause those same water droplets to be forced up the canopy and across the sides. Another factor that really pushed me to Star Citizen was the ships and vehicle options. As of recording, there are 213 ships and vehicles, 151 of which are already available in the game. Not every single one is available for sale, as some are only limited and can go on sale during special occasions, such as Invictus Launch Week. Elite Dangerous pales in comparison with only 36 ships and 6 fighters. From what I can find, and I think this is about accurate, the last two ships that were added to Elite were in December of 2018, five years ago. Of course, ships are just pixels and polygons, but Star Citizen's attention to detail when it comes to interiors and exteriors is stellar. Some ship cockpits have switches and buttons that actually move when flipped or pushed. Engines, landing gear, and ship structures themselves all have this meticulous detail showing every wire and gear and other various moving parts to make it feel more real. Star Citizen gives life to detail and to the environment where Elite Dangerous simply doesn't. Of course, the prior immersion I mentioned is important to some like myself, but the sole disregard for the community's legitimate suggestions and a development team who goes back on the words of the chief executive officer kind of changes the way you look at a game. I still had loads of fun playing it too, but sketchy and shady business tactics while pushing a beta product for $40 to your consumers was only one of the final straws that broke the camel's back. However, I do owe the game some thanks because it introduced me to the space sim category. Had I not been as interested in Elite Dangerous as I was back then, I probably wouldn't be very interested in Star Citizen like I am today. Wrapping things up here, this is more or less an opinion piece. 
It's not my place to tell anyone to stop playing a specific video game, and this video and this episode has no intentions to do that. It's simply my two cents on why I ditched one game and decided to spend my free time in another universe that I feel more immersed and generally more welcomed in. That just about does it for me today, so if you guys have enjoyed this video, please like, comment, and subscribe for more Star Citizen and general video game content. If you guys are listening to this as an episode on the Divine Interventions podcast, feel free to follow and rate the show on Spotify, iTunes, or Google Podcasts, and of course, more episodes are coming soon. Until next time, this has been a Divine Intervention and a warming 07 to commanders and fellow citizens alike.